Welcome to the third season of Murder and 20 Podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder and 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes. This week during spring break, we're featuring one of Murder in Twenties most intriguing episodes. Thanks for tuning in. Nestled on the southern tip of Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada, this is capital, Victoria. A city founded on coal that rose to build the prestigious Empress Hotel and government legislature buildings. A city where flowers blossomed along with its youth. Until a terrible tragedy forever changed its innocence. Rena Virk was born in the winter of 1983. She was the first baby in her family and her aunts and uncles flocked to the hospital just to hold her. Growing up with two younger siblings, she was loved. The Times colonist reported that her mother read her stories and sang her songs, and she was Daddy's little girl. She was a quiet girl who excelled in math, was good at drawing and writing, and had plans after graduation to become a writer. She enjoyed watching movies for hours at a time and got her babysitting certificate and loved looking after young children. Rena had plans to get married and have a family of her own. Rena's extended family grew and she enjoyed spending time with them. She loved to cook and bake. One day she and her Aunt Bina spent the afternoon mixing and rolling out dough to make cinnamon buns. It was a special time for Rena. She was happy. But when she was eight, her parents became more involved in their religion. One that does not celebrate birthdays, Thanksgiving, Halloween, or Christmas. And she missed that. She missed the big family gatherings and attending parties with her friends. In her teens, Rena began to rebel and discovered a way to get freedom was to leave her family for foster care. For a few years, she bounced between foster families and being at home. In the summer of 1997, Rena spent two weeks with her cousin. At night, the two girls could be heard giggling they sat in their cousin's car for hours, blasting loud music, until the speakers gave out. But when summer ended, so did Rena's freedom when she returned home. When things got too much for her, she'd stay with a friend for a day or two, or check in at one of the local shelters before returning home. In the fall, Rena seemed to be emerging into her own. She ditched the blue eye shadow for a softer appearance. Although only 14, she looked much older. That fall, she entered grade 9, but only attended classes for six days. Instead, she spent her time trying to find a place to fit in, where she could belong. She was fascinated with the gangs in the big cities, like L.A. Her need to find friends and be accepted led her to make choices that would come to haunt those who truly loved her. She hung out with a group of girls. She began smoking and tried drugs as a way to fit in. But nothing major, just enough that they'd let her hang with them. She spent time in a corner store where three municipalities converge, Fue Royal, Esquimalt, and Saanich. 
There she found a group of teens, wannabe gang members, that she felt accepted her. On Friday, November 14th, Rena spent the afternoon at a friend's house. That evening, a group of local teenagers gathered at the Shoreline Middle School near the Craigflower Bridge on the Gorge Waterway. Rena desperately wanted to fit in with the group, who were mostly girls between the ages of 13 and 16. She had tagged along with another girl, but the group didn't welcome Rena. A few were drinking before wandering away from the school to an area under the south end of the bridge. The Vancouver Sun reported Rena ended up getting into an argument with two of the girls who were hostile towards her. It escalated, and one of them put out a cigarette on Rena's forehead. She defended herself, and someone yelled out, Bitch fight. The group rallied around the two girls and made plans to blindside Rena. The group manifested into a pack mentality, and soon it was out of control. The girls, along with one lone male, swarmed Rena. They punched and kicked her repeatedly. Then one of them told everyone to stop. Rena had enough. Court records stated that Rena was having difficulty moving, but managed to make her way up the stairs and began limping across the bridge, presumably to catch the bus home. As she neared the north end, two of the teens caught up to her, 16-year-old Warren Glowatsky and 15-year-old Kelly Ellard. Rena neared the park adjacent to the water. There, they attacked her a second time. They punched and kicked her repeatedly until she was unconscious. Then Warren and Kelly dragged Rena to the water's edge. Warren stopped and watched as Kelly pulled her into the water. The salt water lapped against the waist of Kelly's jacket. She pushed Rena's head under water and held it there. As the minutes ticked by, bruised, beaten, and battered, Rena could no longer defend herself as her lungs filled with water. When Rena stopped struggling, Kelly released her grip. Rena died trying to find her place amongst those she thought were her friends. At 11.15 p.m., Kelly ran into Robert. They weren't friends, but he knew who she was. Kelly asked him for a cigarette, stating she was stressed out. He asked her why, and she responded that she'd gotten into a fight with a girl and held her head under water. Afterwards, Robert went home and told his father about the encounter. Rena's parents reported her missing. By Sunday, members from the West Shore CMP and Saanich and Esquimalt Police Forces joined to find her. Rena's disappearance was widely reported on the news, and by Monday morning, rumors of her death were circulating amongst the students at school. By Tuesday, they had escalated and caught the attention of police. Kelly told nine different people what happened that night, about the injuries they'd inflicted on Rena, and boasted that she'd held her head underwater for ten minutes. A week after she disappeared, Robert's father instructed him to talk to police and tell them 
about his encounter with Kelly that night. That day, police arrested Warren and charged him with second-degree murder. That same day, police searched the Gorge Waterway and found some of Rena's clothing. A Canadian Coast Guard helicopter was brought in to search from the air. On Saturday at 1 p.m., they spotted Rena's body floating in the water. Police divers retrieved her body, found a mile from where she had been murdered eight days earlier. Her friend Sean visited the spot and dropped flowers into the water in her memory. Kelly was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. Police seized the jacket that she had worn that night. Six of the girls involved in the first attack were also arrested and charged with aggravated assault. They would become known as the Shoreline Six. Two weeks after their daughter had been taken from them, Rena's funeral was held at a tiny chapel. A city in mourning came to pay their respects, with many standing outside. Rena lay in a pink and blue flowered coffin, a sheer burgundy shroud covering her. After her eulogy, Rena's mother, Sumen, along with female family members, lifted the shroud and kissed Rena goodbye. Then the lid was lowered on the coffin. As it was wheeled out for cremation, it was too much for her mother, and she cried out, No, no, don't do that to my baby. Rena's father, Manjeet, dropped to his knees and comforted his wife. Together, they wept. By May 1988, all members of the Shoreline Six received sentences ranging from 60 days to one year in jail. A year later, in 1999, Warren went on trial in Vancouver. Although he was a minor when the murder took place, the judge ruled there would be no publication ban on the details. Warren was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison with no parole for seven years. He appealed his conviction and lost. Another year went by, and in the spring of 2000, Kelly's trial began in the Supreme Court in Vancouver, where she was being tried as an adult. She took the stand and admitted to participating in the first attack, but denied being involved in the second. When the guilty verdict was read, she was whisked from the courtroom before she could say goodbye to her parents. The judge sentenced her to five years in prison before being eligible for parole. Kelly appealed her conviction, and the BC Court of Appeals ordered a new trial. Kelly was out on bail when she and her friend were drinking in a park in New Westminster, a suburb of Vancouver. An older woman joined them, and within a short time, they accused her of stealing a cell phone. 21-year-old Kelly and her 19-year-old friend attacked the woman. Kelly held her down while her friend assaulted her. Kelly was charged with assault, causing bodily harm. Her bail was revoked, and she was sent back to prison. Almost seven years after Rena was murdered, Kelly's second trial took place in June 2004. Warren testified against her. He took ownership of his part in the murder and said he watched Kelly drown Rena. CBC News reported 
that the pathologist who testified said if Rena hadn't drowned, she may not have survived due to the serious brain injury that had been inflicted upon her. She described in detail her injuries. Severe bruising over her entire skull, forehead, ears, and cheeks. Her brain was swollen and there was an imprint of a running shoe on her head. Pebbles were found lodged in her throat from being held down in shallow water. Kelly took the stand and denied drowning Rena. Instead, she said, I'm obviously going to be convicted. You've got what you want. My life is ruined. The jurors became deadlocked in their verdict, and the judge declared a mistrial. Less than a year later, Kelly went to trial a third time. Dr. Lowell Gray, a forensic pathologist, testified that Rena was alive when she entered the water and that it would have taken three to five minutes for her to drown. Kelly was found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison with no parole for seven years. Again, Kelly appealed her conviction. Nine years after Rena's murder, her parents agreed to meet with Warren and sat across from him in the basement of a church. With remorse in his eyes and a voice full of anguish, he acknowledged the pain he had caused and apologized. A year later, he was granted day parole. In 2008, the BC Court of Appeal overturned Kelly's conviction, but the Crown appealed it and went to the Supreme Court of Canada, who upheld her murder conviction. Kelly would not get a fourth trial. For years, Kelly denied her part in the murder and was denied parole. In 2016, a psychological risk assessment reported that she presented a moderate to high-moderate risk of future violence, particularly over the long term. Throughout her three trials and the media attention, Kelly maintained her unrepentant look of entitlement, anger, and denial. She was permitted conjugal visits with her boyfriend and, while behind bars, had two children. In 2017, 20 years after Rena's death, Kelly was granted day parole and spends five days with her family and two days in a facility. She changed her name from Kelly Ellard to Carrie Sims. And although she has softened in her denial, she still has not claimed responsibility for Rena's murder. As the 25th anniversary of her death nears, the people of Victoria have never forgotten Rena. Just down from where Rena lost her life is Gorge Park. At the base of a tree sits a plaque in memory of her. The rays of the summer sun dance among the green leaves and land on the words. In loving memory of our daughter and granddaughter, Rena Virk, we will cherish you forever in our hearts and memories. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. During spring break, we're featuring some of Murder in 20's most intriguing episodes. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Cynthia Kaufman and James Marlowe. Cynthia left her religious upbringing behind and went on the road with a felon. Fueled by drugs, she and James set out to be the next Bonnie and Clyde. 
stealing cars, robbing, kidnapping, and murder. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music, sound effects from Fasting Studios, and Quick Sounds, and our many editorial sources who were listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com and on all major podcast platforms. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. And feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them, or not shy. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers. <laughs>